I'm here. Mrs. Thomas, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Goma. I'm the uh, president of Women's Federation here in the UK and the chairwoman of um, and vice president of Women's Federation for Europe. We are very happy to and delighted to welcome you uh, to our uh, WFWP webinar on peace and reconciliation in conflict zones, which is hosted by the Women's Federation for World Peace International. Women's Federation was founded in 1992 and is an NGO in general consultative status with the United Nations, with the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, and is active in more than 120 nations worldwide. These Women's Federation for World Peace International Webinar Series, named Women's Federation WFWPI Perspectives, have started this year. While each nation is currently facing challenging situations and having to make difficult choices and decisions due to the COVID virus, Women's Federation looks for hope and to empower women and families therefore has initiated various webinars to share experiences and ideas to resolve these difficulties. Now, I am very happy to officially start this Women's Federation International Webinar on Peace and Reconciliation in Conflict Zones. We will start with some entertainment from our official channel of the UN Women, a song called One Woman. So please wrap and enjoy.
In Kigali, she wakes up, she wakes at choice in Hanoi, Nata, Ramallah. In Tangier, she takes a breath, lifts up her voice in La Hola Paz, Kampala. Though she's half a world away, something in me wants. To say we are one woman, you cry and I hear you. We are one woman, you hurt and I hurt too. We are one woman, your hopes are mine. And She reaches out, then teaches others how to. In Jaipur, she gives her name. She lives without shame. In Manila, Hello, Papa Michel. Hello, bonjour, Papa Michel. You, that was wonderful. Yes, we must shine, shine, shine. Um, may I just make an announcement uh, to all our guests? If you are unmuted, please mute yourself. Thank you. Now we want to give uh, our panelists the opportunity to share their, their thoughts on the theme of peace and reconciliation in conflict zones. Please, could you mute yourself? Thank you. And uh, sorry, yeah, conflict zones. Women and youth across the world have taken many steps towards creating a movement to promote positive change in their communities and in the world. We will explore the challenges and successes of movements in conflict zones across the world. 
and to understand the capacity and challenges involved for women and youth. When they are taken, uh, when women and youth take an active role in leading efforts for reconciliation and conflict transformation. The panelists will present their best practices, their, su their successes and accomplishments, and the decision-making processes that they have contributed to effectively tackling this enormous crisis in the, their diverse areas of responsibilities. Please join me in welcoming our first guest speaker, Dr. Maria Haji Pavlova. She has been an associate professor at the Department of Social and Political Science at U the University of Cyprus, and was the first to introduce gender courses in the department, which is fantastic. She has founded, co-founded many non-governmental organizations, promoted reconciliation and peace across the divides in Cyprus, uh, in, which is, includes Hands Across the Divide, the Peace Center, the gender, gender Advisory Team, and the Cyprus Academic Dialogue. Her book, Women and, Cha Women and Change in Cyprus, Feminism and Gender in Conflict is used widely as a reference. Now she is in the process of writing a book on conflict resolution in Cyprus. Let us warmly welcome Dr. Haji Pavlova. Good day from Nicosia, Cyprus. And uh, thank you very much, Miti, for the introduction. And it's an honor to really be with you all and to share some of our work in, um, in a divided and struggling island, uh, my, homework, my home country, Cyprus, uh, which has been uh, facing a lot of challenges in, since 1974. One of the assumptions of our work uh, at the reconciliation and trust building uh, level in Cyprus is based on the fact that conflicts are gendered and also that the conflicts do not only I did unmute you're fine please go ahead I'm fine okay because I have a note here um, and the second assumption is that conflicts do not concern only the state leaders or policymakers, but the society at large. And uh, according to the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, women should be sitting at the negotiating table, but also uh, in all the peace processes in post-conflict. So what I'm going to do is to share some of the work that Cypriot women have been engaged uh, in this context. Uh, next, please. Okay, so next, I will be speaking mainly about the gender advisory team. One, uh, as Mitty said, one of the women's groups with which I helped uh, co-found in 2009. Now, what is one of my main arguments is that um, in situations where we have a national conflict, usually all other issues um, are marginalized, including, of course, women's uh, uh, issues, which have to do either with gender equality, with rights, health rights, environment, uh, violence uh, in um, domestic um, context, but also other issues that have to do today with migrants and uh, with refugees and sex discrimination. Thus, what we see is that uh, patriarchy, I'm sorry, I need to get this, um, there is a little, white screen on my uh, slides and I cannot really follow that. Okay, 
Now, what we see is that patriarchy, uh, usually in conflict situations, together with nationalism and militarism, they feed each other. And um, this is uh, where we also note that there is the predominance of the male authority over the political scene, which leads us to omissions of democracy and of course, to a lot of other violations of human rights. Next, please. I think um, this is the wrong uh, presentation, but never mind. Okay, I won't uh, go over this because of shortage of time. But Cyprus uh, became a colony and then in 1960 received its independence. We had a coup d'etat in 74, where the de facto partition with the invasion of Turkey on the island. 2003, we had a very big opportunity for citizens at the, um, whereas um, before 2003, we couldn't cross or speak to each other face to face as citizens we had the opening of checkpoints on, uh, along the green line. 2004, we had the first attempt for a reunification, but unfortunately it failed. And since 2017, we haven't had any uh, peace talks. Next, please. Now here the, on the island of Cyprus, there are, um, seven flags, as you see here, which is, of course, a negation of nationalism and militarization in abundance. Uh, the next. Of course, in every conflict situation, we have uh, a culture of conflict that divide, uh, develops. And uh, this, of course, is very much on the bipolarity dichotomy of us and them. Uh, and of course, one of the biggest obstacles uh, to reconciliation are the adversarial narratives that develop uh, in, uh, in the media, in the society, and of course, in the mainstream uh, discourses. Um, one aspect that we see is that pain and suffering in conflict zones become feminized. However, there are uh, points of entry for resistances. And some of these have been expressing uh, their uh, resilience in uh, bicommunal rapprochement work. Next. Next, please. Here are women uh, from both sides of the divide uh, of the missing persons in Cyprus. Next. Here is some of the crossing of ordinary citizens, you know, as a movement from below for reconciliation. Go on. Um, go on because I don't have uh, time. Some of the women's uh, efforts have been uh, the women walk home, which was women's desire to challenge military lines and barbed wires, hands across the divide and the gender advisory team, metamorphosis, just to mention a few of women's um, uh, efforts. Next. And here are, yes, let's go over this very fast, please. Some of women's uh, work in the streets asking for um, the um, resumption of peace talks. Yeah, let's go fast, please, for the slides. Fast, okay, some of the um, activities, the peace buzz. Now, a few things about the gender advisory team, which uh, started in, as I said, 2009, and its main focus has been the implementation of 1325 in the peace negotiations and also in the peace building processes. Next. 
We have to move a little faster, please. Yes, this is the uh, four pillars which we worked and produced a lot of recommendations, participation, protection, prevention, and relief and recovery according to 1325 in the Cyprus context. Next. Now, one of the things that we've done as gender advisory team is that we are uh, used a multi-level strategy, which I think this is uh, where we become very uh, visible and very effective. We worked at the with the leaders, with the negotiators uh, in both communities. And the, our recommendations on the four subjects that are at the negotiating table. Um, namely, governance um, and uh, uh, property, etc. We worked at the meso level with the diplomatic community, with international NGOs, and at the macro, uh, micro level at women's NGOs. Next, please. Okay, some of the achievements of, uh, of, of GATT has been the uh, appointment by the negotiators, a gender focal point, which was not there before. We opened up also a public discussion on women's participation in the peace talks, and we also um, as, uh, uh, lobbied for the establishment of a technical committee on gender equality, and some of our members are uh, part of this committee. Uh, next. Okay, the other achievement I think in terms of visibility and, and uh, influence is that all in all the reports of the security of the general, um, as, uh, the general secretary of the UN in all his reports has been including the work of the gender advisory team, making thus the local um, political scene to be acknowledging the value of women's contributions to the peace process, but also to the uh, reconciliation in a broader uh, level. Next. Next, please. Uh, the women's uh, agency, I think uh, I will finish with this. Uh, uh, women today cannot really afford to stand by as onlookers as the pre uh, peace process will unfold, hopefully very soon. Now it is time for Cypriot women from all communities to transcend their ideological, ethnic, and other divisions and organize in a big movement across the island uh, uh, and demand the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325. Why? Because this is both an issue of gender equality, democracy, and women's uh, human rights. And of course, we have and we can propose the creation of a Ministry of Women and Gender Affairs in the new Cyprus uh, Republic. Next. And here are some uh, visual uh, photographs from our activities as, as gender advisory team. And finally, yes, some more of these. Uh, we had a regional conference on 1325 where women came from the uh, region and the Middle East. Um, and here, an example of uh, the meso level contacts we've had. And here with the Secretary General, uh, General's uh, representative in Cyprus and the technical committee. Um, our motto is that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people, but I say committed women can change the world. 
indeed, it's the only thing that ever has been uh, achieved. And this is uh, from uh, uh, Margaret Mead, a famous anthropologist. So the future is what we do today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Haji Pavlo, for your presentation. You touched on so many important points, especially about the gender um, advisory team, how they have been really working with these three pillars to engage women on the local level and also on the governmental level. We need to work from top down, bottom up. It's a very important uh, aspect and the important contribution that women bring into the decision-making and negotiating tables. Thank you very much. I do apologize for the interruptions that were happened, but um, I think we got the uh, gist and the message that you would like to share. I'm sorry, the time is very short. I know you have a lot to share. I would like to, yeah, thank you. I would like to make an, a little announcement that we will have, we do have a queer, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this, um, the presentation of our speakers. So please do jot down your questions and any comments that you would like to share with us in our chat box. Thank you. So could I ask? So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Naoko Kumagai. Dr. Kumagai has been working on issues around comfort women. She believes the pursuit of reconciliation and her research has found um, in the importance of a victim-centered approach. Now in her presentation, she will share how, she, uh, how the victim-centered approach was valued and applied in the cases of Uganda's reconciliation programs in which many victims were also child soldiers. In this case, she will highlight uh, the delicate voices of the victims and will address the important reconciliations. So the floor is yours, Dr. Kumagai. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Toma. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening from Japan. Uh, my name is Naoko Kumagai. Uh, from now, um, I'd like to uh, present the reconciliation process uh, in Uganda, in which uh, many children suffered as child soldiers. Um, <clears throat> First of all, um, in relation to reconciliation, I'd like to the notion of sustaining peace as a part of the United Nations uh, in 2016, <clears throat> um, some basic issue is that for sustaining peace, uh, we need to uh, have a common vision of society, sorry, uh, here, and then all the segments of population should be included. This includes the roles of the young people, the role of youth in the prevention and resolution of conflicts. And then in this course, we have to address the root causes of the conflict, conflict for sustaining peace. Then overall, we have to ensure that national reconciliation happens. And then we need to ensure that move towards recovery, reconstruction and development takes place. So particularly development matters, particularly for youth, as I will explain later. And then overall, we can prevent the outbreak, escalation, continuation, and particularly the recurrence of conflict. Uh, many uh, data show that uh, many conflict uh, ceasefires were violated. Therefore, it's very important that we have this um, sustaining peace. Then, uh, this is uh, from a conflict resolution textbook, but I'd like to show that how conflict uh, is shown as one dynamics. Um, as you can see, uh, Conflict is escalated most in war, but it starts with psychological level from difference or identification or contradiction with each other among groups and the polarization violence. So we have this, I mean, flow of escalation. But after war, we have the de-escalation process 
with ceasefire, peace agreement, normalization, and reconciliation. So now we see that reconciliation is the final stage to for the de-escalation. So for in order not to start the, another cycle of escalation toward war or armed conflict, it's very important for us to consolidate reconciliation. So in other words, for sustaining peace, to prevent another recurrence of conflict, we need to consolidate reconciliation. Then for this reconciliation and sustaining peace, we have to really understand the important role of the youth. And then first of all, young people were significantly impacted by conflicts, um, not just in Uganda, but any other places of conflicts. They were harmed, disabled, and then they are full of fear, and then many of them lose their family members. Despite that, they never started war. And then also young people are deprived of their right to education, health, and protection under fire. So how to make people, young people get involved in peace reconciliation process? We have two stages. First is inclusion. The second is leadership. For the inclusion, we have to address their needs and long-term trauma. This is also important to address the root causes of the war. Because if young people are not really well addressed, they will become um, those who start war in the future. And then we need to empower young people because they will be the future pillar of society. So we have to think in terms of like 10, 20 years time span. So for empowerment, we have to give them education and vocational training along with this I mean, trauma healing. And then it's important that we have to ensure that young people will not be drawn into anti-social activities. And then for leadership, the young people are not just victims, but they are also active supporters for peace and reconciliation process. So they have quite proactive role and they are agent for change. So with this background, I'd like to introduce the case for reconciliation in Uganda. Um, as you might know, the civil war in U U Uganda continued from 1988 to 2006. Even after 2006, there were some um, very fragile moments, but uh, the reconciliation process or peace talk process started in 2006. Then it was a conflict between the Ugandan government and the rebel called the Lord's Resistance Army. And then children and young people are among the most severely affected by the conflict, this long lasting conflict. And then notably, there were child soldiers. They were, they, that's true, they offended, but they were also victims. Uh, the Lord Resistance Army, the rebel groups, uh, forcibly recruited more than 50,000 child soldiers as young as five years old. Mm. So, those children are victims as well as perpetrators, but I think they should be perceived as just victims. And in Uganda, as of 2020, 78% of the population is under the age of 30, which means that we really have to take care of this large portion of this population, which is the young people in Uganda for better and the most sustainable, sustaining peace in Uganda. So here is the map of Uganda. Um, you can see that particularly the, the battle, the civil war took place in the Northern part uh, in the areas of Bulu and Nekitgam in particular. And then, so it's very important that there is a nationwide uh, national reconciliation uh, between the government and then, uh, and then the, those local uh, villages who suffered and then also the rebel groups. And then there are various efforts to assist young people in Uganda. I cannot introduce everything, but there were some from the World Bank and the United Nations Development Program, particularly in terms of the vocational issues and employment issues. And then there was a national youth-led movement called Uganda Unites, 
This was for the promotion of a culture of nonviolence and peace. And then this Uganda Unites um, promoted the peace clubs in schools so that the children will learn what peace is, what reconciliation is from cultural and then sports activities. And then there's also Future Leaders Conference. This is to facilitate discussions between young people from different tribes. So any tribal differences or tribal animosity can be resolved through dialogue among young people. So one of the main part is that they work to get together towards breaking negative stereotypes of each other. So it's very important that which class people are like what, that kind of stereotypes should be broken down. And then secondly, in this future leaders conference, it was designed to provide a counter narrative to the radicalization to the young people are very vulnerable too. So any kind of an easy talk about radicalization should be prohibited, but it's very important and that young people become resilient and then they can have some counter narrative any, to any easy radicalization. Then lastly, I'd like to introduce, ah, uh, yeah, just for your information, this is a peace club in schools. And then this is the uh, leaders, I mean, conference, young leaders conference. And then lastly, I'd like to introduce this uh, um, project uh, by the Transcultural uh, Psychological Organization, Save the Children and UNICEF. Uh, it is the consultation workshop. It is a workshop um, for young people, more than 200 young people, majority of them were former soldiers, child soldiers. And then we listen to them, they listen to them what they want for peace and the reconciliation and what they're ready to do. And then they answered as such that, first of all, amnesty should be given to all but the top commanders of the LRA, which abducted them. So they are ready to forgive, but they want to have responsibility of the top commanders of the rebel group. And then they also requested apologies to those who were abducted and forced to commit crimes. Even though child soldiers were forced to commit crimes, but they need apologies from their leaders. And then also they wanted to have the truth telling by both the LRA and the government before they forgive them. They want to know why did the LRA abduct children? And why did the government fail to protect them? So they want to know truth before forgiveness. Then they want to have the opportunities to testify what happened to them. They want to share their experiences. They want to be heard. And then they wish that any protection to be given during the justice mechanisms so that they will stay safe. Particularly court sessions should be confidential. That is some suggestions. Then they also say that any still missing children should be identified. And then lastly, they said that they're ready to participate in any kind of, not just these formal judicial mechanisms, but also traditional ceremonies led by the elderly. But usually ceremonies are designed and led, conducted by the elderly, but children are ready to participate in the ceremonies so that uh, they can con have the ceremonies in such a way that really heal their wounds. So this way, um, by listening to the voices of the children, we can really see how I mean, delicate and intricate and sometimes very complex voices the victims have. So I'd like to emphasize the importance of sharing and then listening to the voices of the victims, particularly in this case, young victims for sustaining peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumagai, for highlighting some very important issues, especially about the child soldiers. It is very easy to forget that uh, children can be part of the peace process and for reconciliation, and they can be very, much, very often looked over, and we need to hear their voice and what they say matters. 
Um, I'm sure we have lots of questions coming in about um, the, these points. Thank you very much for your presentation. So as um, our third speaker, Mrs. Caroline Hanchin, is unfortunately unable to join us today uh, for, for unforeseen circumstances. Instead, it, we decided that uh, Dr. Gritchting will be speaking on her behalf. She will share a few, mention a few of uh, Mrs. Hanchin's uh, work that she's been doing uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Gritchtin on creating space for women in the DMZ zone in Korea. So I'll, on that point, I would like to welcome our last uh, but not least panelist speaker, Dr. Anna Gritchtin. She is an architect, an urbanist, a musician, she graduated with a Doctor of Design in Urbanism from Harvard University. Uh, she focuses on co-creative, interdisciplinary, holistic and regenerative approaches to urban and landscape designs, in particular on food, water, energy nexus, soil and biodiversity, urban forestry and blue urbanism. She has spent many years studying uh, border landscape worldwide, in particular, the Cyprus buffer zone and the Korean DMZ. She has participated in and created numerous inter interdisciplinary cultural and scientific events and workshops, and also performs with her musical ensemble in Switzerland, Pakistan, Morocco, Quetta, and in the USA. She is a regular speaker in conferences and congresses worldwide and has published numerous journals, books, and book chapters. So let us warmly welcome Dr. Grishtin. Thank you very, very much, um, Mrs. Toma, for this uh, wonderful and very generous introduction. And it's a really great honor uh, and pleasure to be uh, with you and the um, Women's Federation for World Peace uh, today. And also, I would like to thank Carolyn Hanchen, who unfortunately is not with us, but uh, who introduced me to the WFWPI. So I will um, talk about uh, regenerating and rebalancing earth co-creating peace with the nature in border landscapes so i'm based in geneva hello from geneva switzerland and i will be talking about seven concepts the wings of humanity the balancing of masculine and feminine the role of women peace and nature memory forgetting and forgiveness the importance of this for peace and then three uh, projects, the turtles in Qatar's borders, the dancing cranes in Korea, and Venus and Aphrodite in Cyprus. And as mentioned, I will also then include some of uh, Carolyn's uh, slides and work. So these seven concepts also um, refer to knowledge, joy, inspiration, the sacred, trust, connection and honor which are also very important for the construction and co-creation of peace. So the wings of humanity is a Cherokee prophecy, and it says that the bird of humanity has two wings, one male, one female. And it's been flying for centuries with primarily only the, the male wing, and the female wing has been unfully extended. So the bird has been flying in circles. And this prophecy says that the 21st century, the female wing is going to fully extend and express itself fully in men and women. And in this century, women will take our rightful role in the co-equal partnership with men. And uh, as we are all working on in the co-creation of peace. And this is also a shift from an egocentric um, view of, of the world and of society into a more ecocentric one where man women are at the center and amidst all the the sentient beings and species plants and animal species um, this is also a concept that people for earth uh, korea which who i'm working with are also talking about this ecozoic cosmology which means that it's a new sharing culture 
um, which is also a balance between nature and man and feminine and masculine. So um, this balance is important. And uh, we've also heard already earlier with, uh, with our two presenters about the inclusive peace and the inclusion of women's groups. Um, this has been mentioned by Dr. Maria as well earlier. Um, and uh, this was also stated by Ban Kim Moon in 2012. Um, I wanted to just show a very quickly a project uh, stitching the buffer zone in Nicosia where I presented chess pieces and also the visions for the Korean uh, for the Cyprus buffer zone stitching the buffer zone and a piece that I created here was uh, um, these chess pieces which represent these borders and conflict zones and buffer zones and one was um, an homage to Joseph Boyce because he talked about rebalancing the masculine and feminine he was a great um, German artist and it was this interweaving of copper and iron bands as you can see this chess piece uh, for Cyprus is, is a rebalancing of the feminine and the masculine energies so Women, Peace and Nature, um, in 2004, the, the Peace Prize, it's the first time the Peace Prize was given to a project which combined peace and the environment. It was given to Wangari Matai for the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. And here we saw this important movement of where the women were reforesting areas which were eroded. So it was creating livelihoods for the women, but also working on peace and working on the environment. Um, and what's interesting with this, this project is that it was actually translated into public policy and they created um, an atlas of uh, ecosystems and human well-being. So the importance of, of this uh, combination. So this is also the work that's being done by the Women's uh, Federation for World Peace and Caroline Hanschen. And she's actually working with women from the South and the North. And they've arranged uh, meetings between uh, the women in the North and South of Korea. So this is really important of working uh, a whim with the women on both sides of the borders, uh, as also Dr. Maria is doing. So memory forgetting and forgiving, uh, why is this important? Um, borders are the scars of history. This is uh, Robert Schumann who said this, and you can see this map that I created showing that the past, you know, the borders and the walls that have fallen and the ones that are created or in creation. Um, but it's also important not to erase these scars because these are these are the scars of our histories. And so to co-create these into here, this is the, the German green belt where the Iron Curtain was, and a project of creating this into a memory, a trail of memory, but also a green belt where all these uh, uh, species and endangered species are and where one can actually cycle along the patrol path and this is an in inspiration for the projects in Cyprus and Korea and there are also sites of memory of all the victims because we have to commemorate the victims and in inclusion in an inclusive way because often memorials and, mem and commemoration can also be very divisive so this idea of a space of, of inclusive memory and this is the Berlin Wall and what happened in Berlin is when the wall fell in 1989 uh, in the center of the city it was actually erased um, and there's just the, just a copper band but this was my project in 1989 to create a space of memory um, uh, and also a sort of ecological space of memory of commemoration so there were a few areas where these parks were created in the wall and these were initiatives bottoms up initiatives um, from the inhabitants of both sides, from East and West Berlin, to create this Mauer Park, this uh, wall park. And also, there's also abandoned spaces which are used for temporary uses. So there's also the temporary use, and these are eco-communities that were inserted into uh, the Berlin Wall and were allowed to continue their experimental living. So there's also the ecology, the community, the art, and the experimental living. This is a project in Boston that we created when I was living there. Uh, with my uh, with my late husband um, Cheo Jeffrey Allen Solder and it was a space of commemoration for Frederick Douglass he used to have his office there and there was absolutely no memorial or no space for Fred Frederick Douglass obviously lately we've been hearing about the Me Too matters we've been hearing a lot about Frederick Douglass and all these other um, abolitionists and um, so we created a public space in an area and these are the young architects we were working with who created the memorial for Frederick Douglass it was an area that was underserved and there was no public spaces being built by the authorities so we created 
uh, this small garden this is where i used to live we worked with the local community but we also had to go and and fight uh, with the boston redevelopment authority um, so this is something we created a memory and 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 a peace park in in the middle of boston and this is a project in beirut called the garden of forgiveness which is being also pr proposed which i propose in 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 Cyprus and this idea of forgiveness is we have to create spaces of forgiveness in Beirut this is unfortunately not yet been built but it was created by all the communities in a space where there were many different uh, 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 faiths and also many layers of history so as in Cyprus in the in the uh, walled city there are many layers of history and and the idea of having a garden of forgiveness is a, is a memory but it's also a process processing uh, the past as as we've seen in in dr maria's uh, also presentation so um i i have many different scenarios for the cypress green line but i just wanted to talk about the venus and aphrodite um and also why venus because the shrines of venus this is the green line in cyprus but shrines of venus and aphrodite <laughs> Um, um, are often uh, venerated throughout history and both the Muslims and the, the, the Orthodox and all the women used to go to these shrines. So it's something that brings women together. Um, so here you can see the military buffer zone and then this sort of green belt, the future, what can be a future sort of ecological belt. Um, and different scenarios along here for memory, for ecology, for ecotourism, organic farming, etc. And also how it connects existing green spaces. Um, this is just a zoom in where you can see the sort of agricultural fields on North and South Cyprus and some sort of scenarios of organic farming, ecotourism, farmers markets, riparian landscape, etc. And there are also endangered species that have been allowed to flourish in, in this buffer zone, as is the same in the Korean demilitarized zone. And this idea that we can keep some of these structures of the military, this is a military archaeology, um, and keep them then and turn them into the sort of uh, spaces for observing nature. So here we can see on the right, you can see actually different representations of the feminine uh, 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 deities in Cyprus in the very, you know, the ancient cultures and actually the bronze statuette of Aphrodite Astarte also came from Aphrodite, Venus came from Astarte from, from the, the Middle East. Um, and uh, so you can see this feminine representation linked also to the proper cultures in Cyprus. Um, and here is a bit of a provocation because in very in Nicosia and very close to the border, you can see very, very big representations of the nationalist sy symbols, um, whether it's it's uh, the, the Archbishop Macarius or, or Atatürk and, you know, of course, with, with great honor to them. But there's a sort of very giant representations. And here it's just a provocation saying that, you know, the public space also needs to have more representations of the feminine deities. So one of the projects that we worked on with some of the students is the copper um, the copper mines, the abandoned copper mines, and this idea of creating landscapes. These co abandoned copper mines are inside or beside the buffer zones, and they can be translated into new landscapes, and these landscapes can be linked to the Aphrodite and Vesna. So it becomes a sort of cultural landscape, and it's, it's, it's an archaeology of the conflict in the buffer zone, but it's also an archaeology of the prehistoric cultures and also of the feminine um, um, the feminine uh, histories and, and deities in, in Cyprus. So a reviving of this. And these are some of the ideas of what we can bring into these, uh, these copper mines. Um, and also in Nicosia, creating um, spaces uh, in, in all over the buffer zone. So um, I'll also talk about turtles in Katos borders. This is something we worked on with our students. And we know that um, we are losing a lot of biodiversity and species. These are highly endangered uh, hawksbill turtles with our students. We work to recognize them as flagship species. And they're also indicators of the health of the ecosystem. And um, so we worked with this, the undergraduate and graduate students. We created um, awareness. We created events, as you can see here, with children in the university. And we also created a master plan with the master students to create an eco, um, eco beach for the turtles. But there was also a border zone. There's a border a conflict. There was an ancient conflict between Bahrain and Qatar, which was resolved. But now there's a new embargo. And we've actually mapped 
this whole space between the borders. And there's a lot of endangered species, including the hawksbill um, and dugongs and other endangered species. So the idea is to create this ecological peace zone between the two borders. And lastly, uh, we'll talk about um, the cranes. There are many projects that we're working on in DMZ. You can see here the demilitarized zone with the, the red line in Panmunjong, this area where um, uh, where North meets South, but there's also the military landscape, but you also have the regeneration of ecosystems in the DMZ and the idea of going from a deep wound to a beautiful scar. There are also psych sacred sites uh, along the DMZ and, and still a lot of um, uh, sort of association of the shamanism and sites and harvest festivals that are celebrated both in the North and the South Korea still. This Chuseok is, is still a common festival. And you see the sacred species, the cranes are sacred species. They're symbols of peace, of, of also um, longevity, etc. And you can also see that these are represented in the crane dances. Um, so there's a project with the Crane Foundation of restoration of the uh, their habitats because they they fly over Korea and stop in Korea and so they stop in certain areas in the DMZ because these areas have been sort of brought back to nature. So they're working both in North Korea and South Korea on this this project. And I was very blessed to, to be in the DMZ with Professor uh, Kui Gon Kim, and I actually was able to film these uh, cranes dancing together. And so in a way for me, the cranes, when they dance together, um, uh, the, 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 as couples, you know, you can see somehow the crane, it's, it's as if it's the North Korea and South Korea uh, dancing together, the male and the female dancing together. So there's, there's a great symbolism and also the projects that are, that are ongoing now is recreating their habitats uh, in, so here you can see them, them dancing, recreating their habitats. Um, and so um, the, there's different frameworks for these projects in the DMZ, uh, different types of projects. Um, and I would like to, there's also the UNESCO, um, the, pro the proposal to make a UNESCO biosphere reserve on both sides of the DMZ. So I've been working with Professor Kim in, the, in, in Korea, with Professor Azim in, in University of Vermont, and scientists also from Cyprus on making an atlas of a social and ecological cooperation. So it's to allow people to um, co collaborate, so to go from zones of conflict to zones of peace. And peace zones, here we have Carolyn Hanshin, so this is what um, she's been working on, creating peace zones for women and a fifth UN office in South Korea. So the, so the project that she's been working on and that we want to collaborate on is creating the, the peace zone with using the, the, the DMZ as well for the peace zone as, as a space of stability. So this has been already presented at the UN in 2000 by Dr. Sun Myung Moon and, and uh, various different uh, uh, agents. Here you can see other meetings in Geneva in 2009 where the women uh, WFPI was also present discussing the, the fifth UN office in the DMZ in 2014 again. So there's been different initiatives where the UN Peace Park uh, this UN peace complex, so saying that there could be a fifth office for the UN because there, there's not one in the region, in this region. So it would be a unique and, and appropriate place to create this peace zone. And also, once again, just highlighting women's unique role in peace and reconciliation in, in the demilitarized zone. And this is where I'm really looking forward to working with Carolyn and the World Federation for Women's Peace on uh, creating these zones for peace and creating a, a zone for women as well in the uh, in the DMC. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity uh, to to present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gristin. A wonderful presentation. It's wonderful to see women working together to pull their resources <clears throat> and expertise uh, to really um, tackle these pressing issues that we're all facing, especially with the environment, and also to help women who are not able to really advocate for peace. I'm really um, delighted that you will be happy to collaborate together with Caroline on the, making space for women in the, the Korean you know, DMZ zone. Thank you for, very much for your presentation. So thank you ladies for your inspiring messages and important contributions to building peace and harmony, especially in conflict zones. Please let's 
or give one more round of applause for our distinguished panelists. Thank you. So now we will move on to some questions and answers. And um, I have a few questions that have come through. Let me just read them out. This question is for uh, Dr. Maria Hajipavlova. Uh, it, she says that um, you mentioned pain and suffering became feminized. Could you explain what do you mean by that? And thank you for your fantastic work in Cyprus. Shall I answer now? Yes, please. Yes? Oh, okay. Yes, what I mean is that the state uh, in conflict situations very often um, uses women in order to promote its own nationalist project, which is to show how bad is the other, um, demonizing the other in a way for causing all this pain and suffering. So women uh, are being connected to this as if men do not suffer or do not have uh, pain, you know, during the conflict or during war. And actually, uh, from my research on the gender aspects of the Cyprus conflict, I interviewed a lot of men who were taken and, and carried in Turkey, and then, you know, they are fate, well, etc. And many of them returned. So they, they also express a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, but it's not publicly uh, discussed because that will hurt the bigger stereotype of masculinity, how we connect masculinity and war with heroism, with sacrifice and with uh, strength and protection of men, uh, of women and children. So this is what I mean by uh, the state instrumentalizing this uh, women's pain and suffering to promote its own agenda or its own uh, interest. Of course, many women have been resisting that, um, especially after the search of the missing persons and their relatives. Um, yeah, which is another toy uh, in a way of the patriarchal structures. Thank you for that. There's um, one comment here. How is it possible to know if women will advocate for women's rights? Where are the guarantees that the right women are at the table for negotiation? So maybe I'll open up that to the, all the panelists. <clears throat> it's kind of uh, indicating uh, women supporting each yeah. other. Sometimes we yeah. tend not to support each other. Yeah, and I um, think, hmm. yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Uh, no, I was going to say, yeah, this is one big question that we've been also asking uh, ourselves as gender advisory team, which women and also which uh, agenda, you know, do we bring to the uh, table? Uh, and uh, what I found also from my research is that women with a gender consciousness and women uh, who have also um, have uh, taken, uh, you know, their education is also in gender and gender awareness studies have a very different perspective than women who have never really been exposed to this awareness. So yes, there is no guarantee but usually we try to promote women with a gender awareness, with a social awareness, and also with a feminist agenda. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Christy, do you want to say something? Yes, oh, well, I just wanted to, yeah, to mention the importance of the mentoring, but, and also, you know, the rebalancing, and, and um, I think it's, it's important uh, the education, obviously, and um, I think also Dr. Kumagai, you know, mentioned, uh, you know, the breaking of negative stereotypes and uh, etc. So I think it's also really important to have, um, you know, to, to include the men to sort of say we have to promote women, but we also need women who are going to be inclusive. We mustn't create 
you know, a division. It's, I think there's really also this idea of rebalancing and working with men in, in a balanced way. I totally agree with you. Uh, we should not, I mean, hostile men. I mean, I mean, men are uh, important partners. And then in terms of, I mean, cooperation among women, I think that, uh, of course, I mean, different women groups have different backgrounds, maybe regional representatives, I mean, ideologies. But I think what is important for women is that they should see the commonality of something unique program to women and their vulnerability and also the strengths of women so that uh, they can figure out their commonality and then to nurture this important I mean, point of the commonality of women. Absolutely, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, this is uh, for Dr. Kumagai. Uh, from Japan, could you share, how did you as a Japanese woman become involved in conflict uh, resolution in Uganda? which is obviously a distance from Japan. Yes, uh, actually I have been studying the issue of comfort women, uh, particularly in the relationship between South Korea and Japan. Uh, as you know, the issue of comfort women is those uh, particularly young women, particularly from Asia who are, I mean, who claim that they are forcefully recruited by the Japanese soldiers to provide sexual services to Japanese soldiers then uh, we have still have the issue going on. And I have been studying the issue still, but I mean, through this particular case study, I have been thinking about what it means to reconcile, what it means to forgive. And then I thought that I want to see other cases. And also from my educational background, uh, I have been teaching the course of conflict resolution, and I have been uh, teaching to students from um, the foreign students in Japan from Africa, uh, from Mali, from Cote d'Ivoire, from Sierra Leone, and from Kenya, South Africa. So I heard many experiences from them about their thoughts. I mean, those countries have some kinds of conflicts or internal issues. Then um, I decided to see more cases from Africa, and then Uganda became one of the cases. And then particularly Uganda's case attracted me in the sense that uh, the victims are children, particularly the child soldiers, which creates such a very complex issue because they themselves have the experiences of committing so-called crimes, even though they are forced to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. Actually, there is another question based on that. Um, it's, uh, you know, the program that you spoke about, they're asking is of reconciliation and reintegration of child soldiers. Um, is it possible or is it being replicated in other nations? And if not, what are the obstacles stopping it? To, for in, reintegrating child soldiers? Yes, I think it right. is, if there's any obstacles, it's the lack of education or the lack of um, vocational training opportunities. And also on the part of the host communities, uh, they should be ready to accept those former child soldiers. Mm. Thank you. Okay, I have one on blue urbanism. Uh, what would it mean to live in cities designed to foster feelings of connectedness to the ocean? So that uh, thank you. Yes, um, the blue urbanism is actually it's based uh, on on uh, um, Timothy Beatley's book, which is that actually a large amount of our cities are built on on the ocean and we tend to disregard, uh, you know, the ocean. So what we're doing on land has a great effect on the ocean. And we're, we're learning about this more and more, whether it's the microplastics, the pollution, and we're very much dependent on the ocean as well. So, um, uh, so this idea of blue urbanism has many facets, but the one which is, is having this, um, where we look at this interface, where the city, the interface, the city and the ocean, is one where we become much more ecologically conscious about um, about what we're doing on the land and what we're we're sort of putting in the ocean and in the water and destroying the habitats. I mean, in fact, because we're depending on those habitats, a lot of our resources, you know, whether it's energy, food, etc., 
is coming from the ocean. And another question is actually in the blue urbanism is the question of climate change and rising seas. Um, so many, many cities around the world are, are, you know, are also threatened by this. So that's another question is how do we create an ecological infrastructure? So now we're talking not about heavy concrete, you know, e infrastructure, but really using ecology to create more resilient edges. So this interface between the city and the sea is using ecological infrastructure. This morning I just read something uh, and I it's it's something we've used with our students about um, in uh, in the United States, how the oyster beds actually, you know, using oyster beds and creating these and developing them is a way of uh, combating climate change, creating food, and it's an ecological system which is actually helping our environment. And we also see this with um, mangroves, for example, um, because they create very, you know, beneficial ecosystems. They they capture a lot of carbon, and they can also create these resilient edges. So, so this is just one aspect. Um, uh, I hope that that uh, could answer the question. Yeah, thank you very much. It's um, important. Uh... Yeah, I did like the point that you mentioned, uh, uh, e eco, not ego, you know, that uh, we are um, part of the creation and not uh, to, like stewardship over the creation, we should yes. take care of it. Yes, thank you so yes. much. Thank Actually, you. because um, we are very limited in time, we'll have to end the questions and answers here. I'm sorry, uh, there were so many questions. And uh, there are, uh, we will forward them all to you after the webinar has finished. You have many comments mm -hmm. as well. So much. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. I mean, it's an amazing. We have such accomplished women amongst us uh, dealing with so many diverse issues and they're all contributing to world peace in, in their own unique way. And we need to work together so that we can all be part of this um, network, really um, making a change. And we should never think that I'm alone and I can't do anything. Actually, one person can do a, a lot of things. So let's all work together to make a difference. And, and also I'd like to thank all our participants from all around the world. I heard that there's 88 nations that are connected and over seven to 800 people are watching this uh, webinar. It's been a real honor for me to have this opportunity to facilitate I feel it's not enough time. These kind of uh, discussions need to go on for a little bit longer. So thank you very much. This we're coming to the close of the peace and reconciliation in conflict zones. So it's not finished totally yet. So please stay seated in your seats uh, as we will continue with our next part of the program, which is the closing ceremony for the Women's Federation International. 2020 assembly. This part will be hosted and moderated by our Secretary General, Mrs. Paris Moon, who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to organize these webinars. I'm very grateful to her for the opportunity that I could have to facilitate. And I'd like to thank every single person for their contribution and for this webinar to happen. Thank you very much. So sit back and enjoy.
again and one together, hand in hand. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. What a wonderful performance. Beautiful. G -G. Background. It's too dark, so I can't, I don't know. So is it, can I just to see it without image? Sure. Sure. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry about that because I'm in a, uh, in a highway. So thank you. What a wonderful performance. Beautiful. Now we'd like to invite Madame Julia Moon, international president of WFWP, to give Crossing the mark. Welcome, Madame Moon. Thank you, Paris, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here again today. Thank you for the wonderful session uh, from all our panelists and Mitty, who was wonderful moderator for us today. Uh, beloved women leaders and guests from all around the world, uh, these past two days were truly inspiring. I think I think for all of us. Uh, I would like to truly express my deep gratitude to all the panelists and participants coming from all over the world for your cooperation and your participation, which has enabled us to conduct a truly uh, highly fruitful and um, inspiring virtual assembly. Although the global spread of COVID-19 has had a severe impact worldwide, uh, we could join our hearts and our minds to share valuable knowledge, insight, and experiences on how to bring sustainable peace to the world by empowering and encouraging each other. As it is said, smart alone, brilliant together. 
or as I once learned in an arts conference that I attended, Ubuntu, which is I am because we are. As Miti said just a few minutes ago, uh, there were more than 750 uh, participants from uh, 88 countries registered for our first assembly. Uh, this has by far exceeded our expectations as it, and is indeed very, very encouraging. I wish that we could have had more time with all of our panelists. I think we could have gone on all day or all night, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, I sincerely hope uh, that the new friendships will be long lasting uh, and that they, these friendships can help lay the foundation of a global women network. Uh, I hope that you, that we can all stay committed and inspired to collaborate and create a culture of harmony, beauty, reconciliation, love and care as women leaders and peace loving global citizens. Once again, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all of our panelists today and, and from yesterday and the staff who have helped tirelessly behind the scenes to make this assembly possible. Thank you for coming together and contributing your time and your precious knowledge. We look forward uh, to seeing you all again in the future, uh, WFWP assemblies and webinars, and we will do our best to continue this virtual journey so that together we can better contribute to making this world a more peaceful and healthier world, not only for ourselves, but also for future generations to come. I pray for your continued health and wish you all continued success in all of your current and future endeavors. You are all truly heroes and champions of peace. And I send you love, last but not least, from our beloved founder, Mother Moon, who I know is with you always in her heart. God bless you, your families, your communities, and your nations. Thank you very much. And 사랑합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moon, for the speech. We truly inspired and support these webinars, and we really a champion of peace. Thank you very much. Last not the least, I would like to thank you all participants, wonderful panels, and moderator and translator for your great support and dedication. Also, our technical support team who works behind the scene. Thank you and have a wonderful evening and wonderful day. Again, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. I hereby declare the 2020 WFWPI Assembly officially closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.